Welcome to a Carfection Plus. Uh, we're at Bugatti, we're in Molsheim, and we're on the estate, and I have with me none other than Andy Wallace, who's been unlucky enough to, well, we've known each other for a few years now, haven't we? Um, and you've had to sit next to me today in a Chiron. I've always been impressed by your driving here, <laughs> but, but the one thing you that... You to say nice things, it's I fine, do, it's I fine. do, because it's really true, don't. it's true. But, but the next bit is, I think, even more impressive. What, what really signed me on as your number one fan was when you cycled all the way up Mont Ventoux <laughs> on your bicycle. Um, because I'll tell you what, that was hard work in a car, never mind on a bike. But anyway. Anyway, we thought we'd have a quick chat because Andy knows all about Bugatti, or certainly more than I do, and probably more than you do. So um, we're in, well, a very a hot house. And it certainly is hot in here, actually, isn't it? Um, this is the Orangery. It is, and this building was actually the, one of the few buildings, or the only building here, that was designed by Ettore Bugatti himself. So we've got the atelier over there, which there's a lot of photographs that have been done, so they'll be up on the CNET site, so you're going to have a look at those, that's a sort of better look behind that. We thought we'd have a look at some of the old buildings. So this came back into VW's ownership in 2001? 1998. 1998. Um, was when, yeah, when VW bought the brand. Yeah, um, yes. And then this area was a little bit in ruins and these two buildings here this one which is the Remy's Sud and Remy's Nord the other side of the mm -hmm. chateau when everything was being restored the uh, government the local government said well actually you can do anything you want with the chateau we've got loads of those in this area <laughs> but these two Remises need to be put back exactly as was it's well there's something. something in here that you might be very interested in um, we will get to the full car in a minute so you know, <laughs> don't worry there is a, there is a shear on out there we'll get some details of that Right, well, something that you might be interested in, in looking at in here mm. is this very fine engine and gearbox. Wow. That is enormous. It's huge, isn't it? It is. It's Absolutely enormous. vast. And then you look at it and you think, where does this fit in the car? Because when you look at the car, yeah. there's no way there looks like there's a place for this. But That's I mean, one, uh, one thing to say is, mm. why is it this big? Mm. Well, apart from the fact that it's 16 cylinders, mm. the reason that the engine is big is, is pretty much durability. This is, this is the key to everything. I mean, we've got cars which have done well over 100,000 and you drive them and they've had the regular service in, but they're good as gone. They feel like a new car. You could get 1,500 horsepower from a much smaller V8 if you wanted mm. to, but you're talking about a very short service life. So this is still a less than 100 horsepower per cylinder, of course. Mm. Ricardo gearbox, obviously. Which yes, which is um, from a different gearbox now, a slightly bigger gearbox. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, um, like on a, a single seater where you'd have the gearbox out the back and the drive shaft going here, mm -hmm. this is spun the other the way, way the gearbox is under your elbow. And this is how you achieve 45% front weight on the car with a 16 cylinder engine. <laughs> as, I, as I was trying to explain to you before, normally you would have these four cylinders and a separate exhaust manifold blowing this turbo. Mm -hmm. Same there, obviously times four. Yep. Now, I have driven the car with all four turbos working at the same time, mm -hmm. and you have to wait till about 4,000 RPM before you get max torque, because obviously they're, they're yeah, big, they're 69% bigger. bigger than um, Veyron. They're wow. huge. The solution is to join these two manifolds together. So now you've got eight exhaust blowing into the same manifold, mm -hmm. and then this simple valve, electric valve, it closes this one turbo. <laughs> so as soon as you go from yeah. low RPM, you're forcing all eight all exhausts of, through. So that's one. going to spin up. Yeah, and, and the, the turbo is big enough to reach maximum boost with only two turbochargers. But the reason the other two have to join the party is purely for volume. So at 3,800, the valve opens, takes a short while for it to build speed. Mm. And then by 4,000, when the two turbos would start to run out of volume, you've now got four. Yeah. So when you reach max power, which is 6,700 RPM, you need 1,000 litres of air per second for combustion. So hence the four turbos, hence the four big turbos. So, like so the engine as a whole, I know <clears throat> obviously a lot internally has changed, so the Conrods are now obviously can take much more power, but they're the same weight and the same crank shaft and things like that. Well, a lot of work was done on the bottom end to make it strong enough for the job. Mm. And what was desperately wanted was not to increase the weight of the engine. So in total, the weight is the same, and that was achieved by using, in fact, I'm not sure you can see it on here, but the inlet manifold, yes, you can actually. The mm. inlet manifold is a, a complete oh, wow. yes. uh, composite piece. It, it's an absolutely beautiful piece. That is amazing. Weighs almost nothing. 
And so what has happened uh, almost accidentally is the engine's the same weight, but the CG's lower. <laughs> then there are other problems that you need to solve. Things like joining these two carbon or composite tubes together. So again, this is a patented piece, this actual rubber piece. And on a purely aesthetic point, I love the fact that these have just got the EB oh, it's beautiful, in there. It? It's just, yeah. I mean, there's no need for that, is there? But People aren't going to see it, but, no, it, but it's it, just... Well, even this, this, I mean, look at this cool. carbon yeah. engine mount. It's absolutely beautiful. You won't see it, but... No. And whilst we're here, actually, we talk about the because there's now a carbon rear subframe on this that there wasn't on the Veyron, is that right? Correct, yes. It's a big shell that goes around the engine. It's almost like a second monocoque, mm. which then gets bolted together to the main one. I think um, somewhere there's, there are only 10 titanium bolts holding the rear subframe to the main yes one got that's it. it's incredible but when you see it all fit together it just yeah. needs oh, it's just uh, yeah it's, that's all it's sort of, but it's, it's still there's something sort of crazy <laughs> that it's sort of. what is amazing though is when we, we talk about this um everything's so stiff on the chassis and yet when you drive the car there's no vibrations coming through no no you get a, you sort of it's because it's firm and you you feel the road as you would expect with tires that big in a carbon tub but as you say it's isolated from it so it's not it's not crashy, it's never crashy, you don't get the resonances that you might expect from no. having you know, so much carbon in the, in the chassis. Well, you would, and you'd think um, somewhere in the rev range yeah, there would be a vibration, yeah, exactly. but there isn't one. <laughs> there is, um, there's, a, there's another thing, and I know again we're not unique on this, but if you, if you have a misfire in a four cylinder or a six cylinder or an eight cylinder engine, one cylinder's not working properly, you know straight away you can hear it. Mm. And if, in the case of most engines, you can feel it. But if you lost one cylinder, one cylinder wasn't working correctly, you probably wouldn't hear anything different and you'd still have 1400 and whatever horsepower, 1410 horsepower. So what we use is an ionic sensor together with lambda sensors and yeah. all the other things. And, and, so, and this is counting the ions released in the explosion on each firing stroke on each piston every time and then matching it to its, its required well, value. Ettore Bugatti used to entertain his clients in there, that's what we do now um, on the lower floor, the middle floor is um, office space for so You for do sales. your dancing, is that right? Yeah, almost. You do your magic tricks <laughs> and sort of, yeah. And then, well, the top floor is the most important floor of all, that's the finance department. Ah, oh, excellent. Good stuff. <laughs> and Some and very, have... very good people work up there. <laughs> <laughs> um, and here we have the car. And so, so details on this that we can talk about them before. So the first thing I wanted to talk about was the sort of shrouds almost in the brakes in there which you were talking yes, about. Yes, again this this shroud um, that you can just about see poking out from the disc. So mm. first of all the disc is 420 millimeters diameter. Yep. The calipers, um, although they're bigger and stronger and stiffer than, than Veyron, they're actually lighter by a couple of kilos because they're an organic design so the material is only there where it's required for the okay. stiffness and it's yep. taken away from everywhere else. There's four pads and eight pistons in each caliper at the front and of course the, um, with multiple piston calipers they're all different sizes to make sure the pad doesn't wedge as yeah. it wears. Um, these bells of course you've got different materials here you've got uh, you've got steel wheel bolts you've got titanium you've got carbon uh, ceramic and you've got everything so of course they um, expand at different rates and so you would get if you bolt these up tight you would actually get a vibration oh, yeah. as everything was to warp but the trick is, is to make them so that you've got the expansion room available. But at the same time, on a racing car where they're loose, they just clonk the whole yeah. time. So these don't do any clonking noises, but everything, <laughs> whatever the temperature of the brake, um, there's no vibration coming through the pedal. And importantly, the pedal is always the same height every time you push on the pedal. You never get a long pedal and wonder, you know, oh, what's happening? Yeah. Yeah. So this shield that you see around the outside, in fact, is a, a, another patented piece. And it's designed, it's a stationary piece and it's designed to create a vortex around the disc to help suck out the hot air. And where um, on a track the Veyron would reach 1100 Celsius, this is down to 900 now. BG rating for the Cup yep. 2 tyres on here. Special, yes, yeah, special tyres made for us by, by Michelin. And we'll mention um, as well, because I don't know if it'll make it, it might make it into the main film, but these are actually slightly larger front tyres, but smaller rear yeah. tires in terms of width. Yeah, they're actually 20 millimetres wider. It's quite long, isn't it? Yeah, so these are 285. They were 265 on the Veyron. Mm -hmm. The Veyron had um, 365 rear. These are 355. Yeah. You've got yeah. normal brake on and air is coming in from under the car, but you've also got an additional 
brake duct, which is blowing the air straight onto the yeah. caliper. And the badge, the only bit they didn't try and save weight on. Exactly, it's an absolutely <laughs> solid silver and enamel, isn't it? It looks beautiful. What I was going to show you here, and this, just so you can feel the weight of that, it's actually it's two and a half grams. But that's not so much the, the interesting part, but when you're at 420 kilometers per hour, this far from the center line, already you're talking about 3000 G when you get to this point. So this actually weighs seven and a half kilos, trying to escape just that. the cap. The pressure and temperature sensor is only 44 grams. That's 131 kilos at 420. So you think about all this. All this is why forces. you don't build a fast car in your garage at home. You yeah. design it and you test it and you, <laughs> you do everything properly. The car is limited to 420 because we've decided that we're happy yeah. at 420 and yeah. it's safe. But we, of course, the car is faster than that. And yeah. maybe one day we'll find out. Absolutely. Yeah. I'd like to point out I didn't do that. Okay. And actually, I'd like to point out, nor did I. Okay, fair enough. So neither of us did that. So. <laughs> Four exhausts are here, but there are actually another two exhausts. There's another two hiding underneath, blowing the diffuser, as you can probably just about see underneath. I'm sure you understand anyway, and everybody watching is going to understand too, but downforce isn't some sort of mythical thing that you just stick on the top of the car. It acts over the car, and it acts relative to the front and the rear axle. So if you have, you can have all the downforce of the world, but if it's all on the front axle, it's absolutely undrivable. And the same is true if it's on the rear. So this balance, this aerodynamic split, mm. if you like, is an important um, feature. And so whenever you see a, a wing extending, of course, you're adding downforce to the back of the car. So you've now upset the balance. So you have to change that to make sure you've got enough on the front. So when we deploy the wing, when you reach 112 miles an hour, 180 kilometers an hour, the car goes into a autobahn mode, mm. the wing will extend, and then the, the car actually drops, but it rakes to make sure you've got more on the front. And that gives you your, your aero balance. So it's, uh, is it uh, 20 mil? So it goes down one millimeter at the back and 20 millimeters on the front. But then if you use the, and we're limited to 380 kilometers an hour, 236 miles an hour, I think it is, in the, what we call the standard mode. And yeah. then you've got the second key, which we can yeah. show you. Oh yeah, that's on the other side. Now what you do with this one mm. is, um, once you've decided that 380 is not fast enough, you, um, you insert the key, you're sat in the driver's seat, seat belt on, everything's fine. Mm -hmm. You then put it in and twist it. And what you're doing is asking the car to go into top speed mode. So it will then go through a system of checking, making sure it's happy that everything's as it should be. Mm -hmm. It even checks the age of the tires, for example. Um, because obviously if... Oh, I've seen it, yeah, it makes sense, old, but it's just the idea yeah, of the car checking yeah. the age of its own tires. <laughs> it? So at this point, it reduces drag by reducing the rear wing. Mm -hmm. It reduces the ride height again. Then we've got to take downforce off the front to, to keep that balance I was talking about. Yep. So the diffuser under the car, which is quite a steep shape, there are two hydraulic flaps in front of the wheels, that, which are normally up. So the shape of the diffuser is like this. The two flaps come down and now you've got a more flat right. area. So you've reduced downforce. So in fact, what happens is after you've asked for top speed, it's accepted it and you want to go, there's your road. You go and once, as long as you're going straight, you're fine. If you go more than, your hands at the top of the steering wheel or you activate stability control or ABS it'll say actually no you're going to go 380 and you can ask for it as many times as you want <laughs> but each time you've asked for it you have to go in a straight, straight line. line. So here's a question for you what do you do at Aerolessian because you've got the banking we have got yeah. to put lock on. There's always somebody who comes up with this, uh, <laughs> this thing. Well, I'm going to put this back. <laughs> <laughs> Whilst you formulate your answer. <laughs> I can tell you something very interesting about that. With the, with the Veyron, you yeah. came off the banking, around 200, down onto the flat, and then you've got roughly eight or nine kilometers straight, and then you've got yeah. the banking at the other end. So you came off at, at your, yeah, 200, down onto the flat, you accelerate, you get to 400 or whatever it is you're gonna get, um, and then you get to the other end. Now with this one, you can actually come off the banking, stop the car to zero, go, <laughs> reach it, and still stop before you get to the other end of the banking. <laughs> so there's your problem with your answer. Fair enough. Um, it's staggering how much faster this car is from 100 to 300. That's the yeah. area that you really notice. Just, I mean, obviously you set the famous top speed run in the, the F1. In the McLaren F1. Ago, yeah. And I did it actually, I did it, step one back from that. I did it in the um, XJ220. Oh, you did it? Jaguar. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And then, yeah. Then it was in McLaren, wasn't it? Yes, yeah, yeah. that's it. After, After that. that. 
Uh, I, mean, I mean, getting the last few miles an hour to the McLaren must have felt like sort of blood out of a stone compared to, <laughs> you know, well, it's quite I, difficult, it, really, compared to doing it. In <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I watched the, the video, and it, it's funny because on the video, you, um, you, what you don't see is the movement, mm. and and the thing. I mean, this is an iconic car. Let's, you know, there's yeah, no, yeah, no, yeah, 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 nothing yeah, to say bad about the car, <laughs> no, but it didn't have the horsepower that we've got, so no. therefore it had to have a lot less drag to go that fast. Yeah. So the car actually did wander quite a lot. Now. If you look on the video, you, you look, well, what's he talking about? But actually, when you start going over 100 metres per second, so 360 k's is 100 metres per second, isn't yeah. it? So we did, what, in one direction, 391, 243 miles an hour. It's only got to wander a very, very small amount before full <laughs> alarm is going off. No, I'm not doing that. Why is it doing that? Do you see what I mean? So, yeah. you know, with this, because we've got a lot of power, we can afford a little bit more drag and, and then therefore downforce stability. And so yeah. that's the difference. But you're talking about 1998 to to now. Yeah. So it's quite a, a lot difference. happens in that time. Absolutely. Yeah. Andy, thank you very much. Been a pleasure. That's been and nice. you can keep <laughs> your bicycle really into yourself. <laughs> I will do. It's fine. It's fine. It's absolutely fine. So, um, so there we go. That's the car Fiction plus all about the Chiron. Um, I hope you've enjoyed it. And subscribe to the channel. Any other questions you've got, put them below. And well, I'll call you up and ask you. <laughs> Easy, no problem. There you go. Thank you very much for watching. That makes a change for you from screwing things up, isn't it? Unscrewing them. It's, um, <laughs> sorry, I just... Somebody had to so say so it. So nice on camera, <laughs> and yeah, just as soon as it's going to...